Perhaps you could assist me by lifting me up there? Uh, one question. You do not like beasts or trolls? What he looks like matters? I do not care what he looks like. What I do not like is not knowing. Now, here, just take hold here. With a lift, I... I believe I can make it over the garden wall. You want me to lift you over the wall so you may escape? That is what I said, yes. People will notice you are missing, will they not? I shall worry about that later. Now, if you please, I just need a little help. Come, make haste. I have absolutely no intention of helping you. I am a lady in distress. You refuse to help a lady in distress. I refuse when that lady in distress is trying to go over a wall so that she does not have to marry me. Hello, Charlotte. I am George. I am deep, please. Your Majesty. Not Your Majesty. George. I mean, yes, Your Majesty, but... So you just, George. I am... Please accept my apology. If I had known that you were you... You would have what? Not told me that you were trying to escape? Well, yes. Mm. I mean... <laughs> I do apologise, Your Majesty. George. Just George. <laughs> From Providence, Rhode Island, welcome to Bridgerton with Mary and Blake. It's a podcast dedicated to Bridgerton on Netflix. So sit back, relax, and let's get ready to spill the tea. Hello, everyone. My name is Mary Larson. And I'm Blake. Just Blake. Oh. Oh, you went there. This is so cute. I did it. So stinking cute. We're oh back my on goodness. Bridgerton, Marvin. We are. And, you know, we're really excited because this, of course, is a spinoff show from Bridgerton. So it's still within the, the Bridgerton universe, the Bridgerton sphere. Blake and I, of course, have podcasted about uh, seasons one and two of Bridgerton. Yes. So if you haven't heard those yet, you can scroll on back in our podcast feed to find them. But of course, when the time came up, when they announced that they were doing this Queen Charlotte spinoff, Blake and I said, well, of course, we're going to have to cover it. Yeah, uh, there's no, there was no question about it. Like <laughs> we, we were absolutely going to do it. I was actually thinking, Marvin, should we, should we change the intro to this podcast now and just say it's a podcast dedicated to the Bridgerton verse? Oh, I mean, maybe, maybe, but we'll we'll see. You know what? Maybe if they do more spinoff shows, I. You know what? The amount of publicity and success that Queen Charlotte is having, I'm going to put the mortgage <laughs> on the fact. That they're gonna there have. A, there's gonna be some more. Spin-offs. There will be more, but we will see. Well, of course, Queen Charlotte debuted uh, with debuted s- debuted <laughs> debuted, and I don't know how to speak properly with six episodes, and there has been no talk yet about there being a second season of Queen Charlotte. They specifically went in saying, "Okay, this is going to be a we're limited tell series. our story yes. exactly." So for the time being. We're just going to be Bridgerton, and this, of course, is adjacent. Well, before we get into this, we do want to welcome our... Our, our lovely r- listeners who are new to Blake and I, because some of you may have stumbled upon this podcast for the first time because you found Queen Charlotte. Correct. So Blake and I have been podcasting for a decade now. Oh my God. I know. That is wild <laughs> when you think about that. It really, really is. Jeez, what um, happened to time? And we podcast about book and television shows and movies, and we have a whole website at maryandblake.com with which you can go see. I mean, we really span different fandoms and different oh, yeah. genres. Uh, but we started to podcast because we were lonely new parents. We have two children now, eight and 10. But when we started, we had a baby with colic and we really didn't get out of the house much. Those of you who are in the throngs of parenthood, you know oh, what we're talking about. We know your pain. We, we do. We do. And so we decided to start podcasting as we loved listening to podcasts. And we thought maybe we might be able to connect with other people who like the same shows and series that we do as well. And one thing led to another and MarianneBlake.com took off and we now podcast still in the basement of our house um and so sometimes our children pop on you may hear them you may not but we love what we do and we love that we get to share shows that we find enjoyable and and series that we find enjoyable with you we do want to thank our friends at 
jointhenerdclan.com. So that is our Patreon site, right, Blake? Yes, that's the place where you get a bunch of extra content from Mary and myself. Uh, as a matter of fact, we just put up a knee-jerk reaction to Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3. Uh, we do knee-jerk reactions to Succession and other TV shows that we both like, but we can't or don't have the time to podcast about. Uh, Mary does a Bridgerton book club. I do an Outlander book club. And it's just a great place for community and finding a bunch of nerds that love the same thing as you do and speaking about it with them. It's it's just the best. So go to jointhenerdclan.com because the people there, they make this all happen. They, they really do. They give us the ability to podcast and have a studio in our basement and, and, and engage with the fans and engage with our listeners as much as we do. Without them, this is impossible. So, so thank you, friends, who are If you want some cool there. stuff, you want to keep a, a totally unbiased, big corporation-free podcast like this one going and like our, like our little company is, please go to jointhenerdclan.com and consider... Uh, becoming a member there. All right, let's get into the show. Let's do it, Marvin. Oh, no, that's the wrong song. Here we go. <laughs> that's what we get, Marvin, for, uh, you know, having this, uh, the first episode in, in a long time of, mm-hmm. of Bridgerton with Mary and Blake. So I messed up the wrong, I messed up, I put the original Bridgerton song there when you it's know, supposed to be Queen it's Charlotte. Okay. It's okay. We forgive you, Blake. We forgive you. <laughs> so the episode details, as we are wont to do, and one of the things that you'll find here at Mary and Blake Media is that uh, we like to go over all the different directors and writers because there are patterns and there are things that we all like about certain episodes. creative voices yeah. and, and episodes and, and those who create them. So uh, in this particular case, it's the first episode of Queen Charlotte, episode 101, and is entitled Queen to Be, which is Mm. clearly a reference uh, to what Queen Charlotte is going through and how she is going to end up being the Queen of England. The writer was... Shonda Rhimes herself. Who would have guessed? Who Shonda guess? Rhimes has created this series. She has written the book with Julia Quinn, the author of Bridgerton and all the Bridgerton series books. And uh, she is the showrunner of Queen Charlotte for this limited series. So it, it looks like she is writing all of the episodes, but we will continue to go over them. And if you like Shonda Rhimes, then you know all about her because she's one of the most powerful voices in all of television. However, if you don't know that name, that's okay because you probably, well, I I will guarantee that you've heard of some of the shows that she has either written for or created. She has uh, written for Station 19, obviously Grey's Anatomy, Scandal, Private Practice, and uh, she has also written that show Inventing Anna, uh, which is a really interesting show. And little did you know, Mary, little did you know. She wrote The Princess Diaries Part (laughs) 2. I love it. And she also wrote (laughs) the cinema classic Mm. Crossroads with Britney Spears. Oh, wow. (laughs) Yeah. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. So go back in that time vault. Or don't. (laughs) (laughs) Or just don't. Uh, Yeah, that's a good idea. And the director was Tom Verica. Now, that is a Shonda Land all star. Okay. Uh, Tom Verica has starred in many of Shonda Rhimes' shows and acted and, and directed many of them, including, as a matter of fact, Bridgerton. Uh, and it looks like he is directing all of this limited series. It's lovely. Well, so the creative team behind Bridgerton, uh, the the main voices of Bridgerton are are playing here yeah. in in Queen Charlotte uh, just for the sake of posterity Tom Verica has di- uh, directed episodes 1 and 102 and 103 of Bridgerton uh, Shock and Delight and Art of the Swoon respectively mm-hmm. and then he also directed episodes 205 and Unthinkable Fate and episode 206 The Choice of Bridgerton Love so it. and he'll be directing some uh, some of uh, season 3 as well. Mm. All right. Another thing that we do here at Mary and Blake Media is we like to give ratings. I mean, and, who doesn't, right? You uh, got it. You got to know where things stand compared to each other. Yes, uh, we love we love to give ratings, and for each podcast, we have a different rating system. For Outlander, it's kilts. For when we do uh, the Potterverse, it's lightning bolts. Uh, when, you know, when we did House of the Dragon, it was what was it? Was it dragons? dragons? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, and or we, 
flames. Lisa won so far. Uh, it yeah. Was, yeah, actually, you're, you know, you're right. It was flames. Uh, and so for this one. For this one and for Bridgerton, it's cups of tea. Yes. On so. a scale of one to five, one being the absolute worst, five being the absolute best. So my cups rating. All within context, by the way. It's for that show. It's yes. not like. Shows in general. Yeah. It's just like, okay, yes. a five in comparison to other Yes. episodes of Bridgerton or Queen Charlotte. So on a scale of one to five, I give this, the premiere episode of Queen Charlotte, four cups of tea. Wow. We, you know, for if you're a new listener, you don't know this, but Mary is very much a high grader. She gives fives <laughs> out like Oprah gives out cars. <laughs> Stickers for everyone. A for uh, efforts. Uh, me, I am very much a hard grader, uh, and that's mm-hmm. by design. I expect a lot of my TV shows. However, as we are as we are discovering lately, Mary, I've been grading a little bit higher than you. No, something has changed within me, and I don't something know how that is. Had. You've same. become much more jaded, and I think it's because you're married to me. <laughs> Who knows? Uh, but I'm giving this one a four four. As a matter of fact, awesome. I was. I think I'm higher on this episode than you. Are. you so. You are. And then another thing that we like to do on our podcast, for those of you who are dearest, gentle, new listeners, um, is we do our GBG, our good, our bad, and our great. Think of it like an Oreo. And we like to sneak the little bad thing inside there. So the good that I liked about this episode is the wisteria. And in that, I just mean all of the the settings of mm-hmm. Bridgerton are back. We all want to be there. We all want to be drinking the tea, going to the balls, in these carriages, having our hair done, dancing along to the music, playing croquet. I mean, we we all want it, right? Yes. But the wisteria in general, I love so much that I went out and I bought fake wisteria <laughs> and decorated That's, our dining room with it. And you may or may not start true. to see wisteria here in our office because I'm realizing that we don't have any Bridgerton props. And for those of you who are missing out, we do a video version of our podcast as well. You can find them on our Facebook page and on our YouTube. Just search Marion Blake. But there's nothing Bridgerton. And I think that while we record Queen Charlotte, we may need some wisteria. Yeah. We could take it down and just have like one little wisteria when we're not sure. recording. But right now we're we heavy on Harry it. Potter and Transformers. Yes, yes. So <laughs> the wisteria is my good. My bad. First and foremost, the German was cringeworthy. In what way? Yepskin. Oh, Liebchen. Yeah, Liebchen. Liebchen. <laughs> yeah, whatever it is. He says it twice. Yes. Which is some endearing little term. I didn't even bother looking it up because it felt so awkward. And then at one point I'm when he sees the king, he says, yeah. And so this is just to remind you that they're supposedly from a, a place in what we now know as Germany, um, just to set them apart. But it just felt so awkward. It is German for a person who is very dear to one to another. Okay. So like lovely, honey, sure. sweetie. Sweetheart. Yes. Anything like that. Yeah. yeah. But it just felt weird. Marvin. It just felt, yes, what you like to call me as mom. It just felt weird and it didn't flow for me and I didn't need it to be hit over my head. Interesting that you point that out. I did not enjoy that. Interesting. Uh, because, yeah. And then my actual bad, that brings it down to a four. Because as you said, I'm normally a very high grader. Sure. First, I, I know I don't, I don't do well in premieres. I never have. Never will. I mean, there's very few shows. Lost, I did well in that premiere. But aside from Lost, there are very few shows where I watch a premiere and I'm like, I'm sold. And it took my, you two, two seasons to like Uhtred. Yes. In, in, in The, the Last, Last Kingdom. Kingdom it, yeah. takes me, it took me at least three episodes in every season of Game of Thrones. And this is because I need someone to root for. Oh, did you say Lost? Yes. You did? Okay, good. We have to go back, Kate. <laughs> all right, good. Just making sure. I need someone to love. I am a sucker for all things Pixar. You kill someone's mom or dad in the first two minutes. Oh, yeah. And I'm, if I'm crying in the first two minutes, I'm in. I love it already. Mm-hmm. I didn't love anyone in this episode. Now, granted, I love watching the queen, the, mm-hmm. the elder queen, you know. the I, I don't want to like, they're not even elder, but I'm just going to say that for now. The older well, uh, generation queen, the yeah. current Bridgerton t- current time timeline. frame that we know. But... In this particular episode, I didn't love Charlotte. She was fun to watch. I think she's feisty, mm-hmm. but I don't love her yet. I don't love George yet. I don't love anyone yet. You don't like Brimsley? No, nope, I don't love him yet. Okay. But and that's okay because yes. I know that there's other episodes and there's more time. And I love so much about the show and I can trust it. But just me personally, I found it interesting but I wasn't here saying, oh my gosh, I can't wait. And the other problem that I have, and I'm, and I, you can admit your own faults. Sure. I don't do well with prequels that I know have a tragic ending. Rogue One in the Star Wars universe, <laughs> I knew. I don't know any of these people. That means they all die. I don't yeah. even hear about uh, a lot of these people. Spoiler alert. 
Whatever, it's true. <laughs> it's, and we true. know, because of watching seasons one and two of Bridgerton, that the queen is lonely, yes. that the king is mad, that um, you know he's, he's lost his mind in one way, shape, or form. We never really see him, that mm-hmm. she's just this bitter kind of, you know... But is the argument lonely. against that, though, the journey of that? No, exactly. But I don't even do well with, with Shakespearean tragedies. That's what okay, I'm saying. Sure. If you know it's doomed to begin with, I'm. it's hard for me sometimes. It's hard for me knowing, okay, I loved like the clip that you played in the beginning of this episode. Love it. Mm-hmm. And it makes me sad. And that's okay. Fair, fair. So once I learn to love the characters, I will be able to get to the, through this that I know that it has a tragic ending. Gotcha. Okay. Am I great? Is we're back, baby. Yes. We're back in the Bridgerton verse, and I I steered clear from trailers, from all of the sneak peek kind of things. I did too. I didn't yeah. know that future tense Lady Danbury and uh, Lady Bridgerton were going to be in this show. Oh, I didn't know. I didn't good even. Surprise. I thought it was going to be all in the past. Yeah. To be honest, I didn't even know that the current Queen version was going to be in it. So for us to be spending time watching them get their little invitations and yeah. everything, and then also delving into Lady Danbury's story in this episode, mm-hmm. beautiful surprise made me even more excited. Mary so that is audibly migrate. gasped when she saw yes. <laughs> future Lady Danbury yes. and, and and future Lady Bridgerton. <laughs> Very true. All right. My good is that the, the show, as I said for Bridgerton, the show just doesn't care what you think. It has said, we're going to do what we want to do. And if you don't like it, then Sorry. This isn't for you. Sorry. Like you don't have you're to You're not everyone's it. cup of tea, but this you're somebody's n- shot of whiskey. Yeah, you it's not a documentary. I will say that I'm a I'm like and this is like I'm a little disappointed that they put that that Chiron at the top of the episode where it was like, "Hey, this is a work of fiction." If you don't like oh, it Oh, Julie it, Andrews coming in, dearest yeah, gentle reader. Yeah. This I, is like, I get why they did based. it. Yeah, I get why they did it. Okay. I understand, but I wish they didn't. I, I think they needed to. So I appreciate that you didn't like it. I thought it was great. But I think that, sadly, a lot of people watch things that are based historical fiction sure. and then they think it is true. Uh, so fair. So I appreciate... But I, I like what the show you is doing. I like Aside from that, I like what the show is doing in that it's giving you a history of itself. Mm-hmm. And... It's talking about this seminal moment, right, in in English history. And in this show's case, it's talking about the great experiment, mm-hmm. right? It's giving you an alternative history and treating it as if it were like a legitimate thing. And how the royal family has to deal with that legitimate thing. Yeah. And Michelle Fairley, oh. She is great as the king's mother. She is fantastic. We all know her from from Game of Catelyn Thrones. Catelyn Stark. Uh, uh, Catelyn Stark. You know nothing, Jon Snow. Uh, she is phenomenal in this role. Like she has just that, just enough resting bitch face where it's like, oh. Anyway, what I really, really love is when she says, "This is only a problem if." Mm-hmm. The crown says it's a problem. We make all the rules. Yeah. We can do whatever we want. And the, the the show allows itself to say that. And you believe it. You get it. Like you can understand that kind of arrogance where you're like, yeah, okay, that makes sense. That tracks. <laughs> yeah. That, that tracks. All right. My bad is as much as I enjoy the show and I enjoy being back with all the characters we love and seeing the history unfold unto itself, treating it as a reality. This so far feels like a lot. Like the first episode does a lot of heavy lifting and it does it very well. But for six episodes, oh boy, this is a very tall task because not only does it have to talk about the past? Mm-hmm. It has to explore those stories. It has to give us something new so that it can stand upon itself. And at the same time, it's made a commitment to say, no, no, not only we're we going to do that, but we're also going to push the storyline for the current time forward. Yeah. Uh, and uh, at the same time, 
we also have to go through the journey of what Queen Charlotte goes through and have a completely different understanding of who that person is and why she is the way that she is. There's a lot happening here. And I don't know if the show can do that in six episodes. Interesting. And it feels very packed. It feels very, very Did packed. Did this episode feel very packed? Or is this just you being nervous? My first run through, yes, it felt like, okay. wow, we're moving quick here. I mean, we right. went from zero to 100, like in a matter of minutes. We went from meeting Queen, uh, you know, uh, this princess in Germany to now she's married to the king. Then she realizes that all, all is well. And she's like, I should have just stayed home. And mm. like, we, we went through a lot. We did. Uh, the the wedding invitations and uh, the the problem like get Queen um, the princess getting inspected by M Michelle Farrell like there's a lot here yes. so and there's pro I think there's more here to Brimsley than meets the eye and there's also more here to obviously the king than meets the eye and mm -hmm. how how they're going to weave that all weave in all, it's a lot it is a lot uh, but my great. Uh, the the just George scene. Oh, that is what made me. There's our swoon. Appreciate the king, mm -hmm. uh, and it made me appreciate what could be for that relationship, and that's when I bought in, mm -hmm. uh, because there's a self awareness there from that character. Yeah. Uh, yet at the same time, there is also an indignation and a lack of awareness from the character. When he says, but I'm the king at the end of the episode. And mm -hmm. she says, oh, I thought you were just George. And it, and it's not necessarily a bookend, right? Because that's the just George scene in the beginning. Ha it happens uh, in, in the initially middle. happens about in the middle of the episode, right? But you get the emotional connection. Agreed. And a, a quick turnaround of what that could mean for both George and for both uh, and for um, now Queen mm -hmm. Charlotte, uh, it, it's it's really a fantastic writing device that Shonda Rhimes uses uh, in this in this episode for you know what is ostensibly a pilot, right? I mean, it's not because it was a full order, right? Mm -hmm. It was a full order of six six episodes, but it's a fantastic writing device, and she uses a lot of different writing devices in this episode that I want to talk about. But before we talk about that, Mary, we do also love to go over the music. That yes. goes in on Bridgerton. And, you know, the music is such uh, an important piece of DNA for Bridgerton. Mm -hmm. it, it's in, And the Bridgerton verse, right? We'll, we'll just refer to it as that. It's such an important piece of the DNA because it highlights what the Chris Bowers and, and the music producers and, and even the showrunners want to say. They, they use that as another opportunity, as another character, if you will, to highlight certain things. And, and Mary, what, what is the standout from this episode? So this episode brings up none other than Queen Bee, which I think is fantastic because the title of this episode is Queen to Be. Yes. So Queen Bee, none other than Beyonce. We get to hear uh, a a string quartet version of Halo, which plays. So I love this because. Oh, I love the harpsichord in this. Mm -hmm. The harpsichord just makes this work. <laughs> Sorry. I'm it's okay. The headphones. Mary can hear it too. Thank you. Absolutely beautiful. And the way that this particular bit, the, the vocal line is played, is very sensual with all the sliding. Wow. You know what I mean? Yes. I just find it very dancing and because I actually I didn't like the dance music that they played after Halo like Halo was before Halo was in their in their carriage when they're actually dancing at their wedding it isn't to this you would no, think it would be but it wasn't but it wasn't right it, this is what I wish they had danced to but the dancing music almost made me feel like I was listening to a jewelry box you know dancer but this Halo yes. with Beyonce I loved for the visual reason the the crown that that beautiful Queen Charlotte had, even with her her hair being so natural and the way that she wanted it nice and big. Of course, Queen Charlotte is just known for having all no. of these big uh, big hairdos. That in and of itself kind of made me think of the physical halo. Mm -hmm. And Beyonce's song uh, was written about meeting someone who you build walls up against because you don't know how they're going to treat you. You don't know if they're going to break you. And then when you do find the right person, those walls do come down. And um, it is the is a real thing. So really a lot of what Charlotte went through in this 
storyline and her fears about the king came through with Halo. Now, I will say... <laughs> Cool things about this season's choice in music is that all of the covers that they do are by black female artists, which I think is a really awesome choice. So we're going to hear a few pieces by Beyonce. We're going to hear Alicia Keys. We're going to hear, um, let's see. Oh, even Whitney Houston. uh, Sia. Yeah, right? What? Who? Sia. Is it S-C-A? I don't know. I well, I like I listen to her song. <laughs> You're asking the wrong guy. Yeah, I know, but that that, that person. <laughs> um, so it's just it, it's really interesting. However, one song that came to my mind, who is obviously not a black female artist, was the song "Hey Le- Leonardo." Can you pull this one up? Uh, hold on. No, <laughs> I, no, it, I don't, I I don't it know where Google it is. Drive. I just pull, put go to YouTube. Because <laughs> okay, just what's, Hey what's, Leonardo. Okay, Hey Leonardo. Because I had this not, had they not made this beautiful choice of having all female artists, which I 100% understand and agree with, this is the song that I wish that they, if they were going to have other pieces um, like they have in the past. But once again, I'm firmly cool and I love their choice of what they did. But this is the song that I would have wanted to be a string quartet rendition. Hold it's on. not Bridgerton. Okay. You just all, put Hey Leonardo. All, all right. Hey Leonardo. Which this. one do you want me to do? She likes me for me. This one? No, go down. This oh. That one right there. This one? Yes. Honey. Okay. Yes. Because you probably don't remember this song. <laughs> no, I definitely do not. Okay, Hold so on. We got to mute it, get through the we quick advert. But Hold when on. I was listening to that conversation uh, and she gets to wear what she wants here it is. to wear. I can't hear it because you have your headphones on. My money. Need to get to the get to the chorus bit, my love. Well, hold on. I don't know where the chorus is. I don't know this song. Isn't this, isn't this she likes me for me? Like I can't hear you. Got your headphones on. Well, what do you want me to do, Bob? I need to be able to hear it too. <laughs> Here, you too. Right. You I keep you unplugged it. This is <laughs> wretched. No, technically you unplugged it. Oh my goodness gracious! What do you? <laughs> <laughs> for those of you who are joining us for our first time, I apologize. Well, you, you, you Sorrows, set me up with this Sorrows random prayers. song. Sorrows, prayers. <laughs> there it is. Sorrows. She likes me for me. Yes. yes. So I thought this would have been a cool string quartet rendition. <laughs> okay. Farmer George, I'm going to wear whatever I want to wear. We like each other. <laughs> Never mind. Okay, this just became way bigger of a deal than I thought it should have been. But I always We're just gonna let that one go. But I hadn't know I hadn't taken a look yet at the oh, soundtrack, so I didn't man. know what pieces were gonna be playing. And I I like to guess in Bridgerton. I like to think like, ooh, where are they gonna choose? What's yeah, gonna be yeah, the yeah. vitamin C string quartet, you know, version in this one? And sometimes I get it right, sometimes I don't. And so I did not get that. <laughs> didn't one right. get that one right. <laughs> Not at all. Well, you know, I do like the Halo lyrics that that uh, obviously Beyonce has in her real song. And it's, remember those walls I built? Well, maybe they're tumbling down. And they didn't even put up a fight. They didn't even make a sound. I found a way to let you win, but I never really had a doubt. Standing in the light of your Halo, I got my angel now. It's like I've been awakened. Every rule I had you breaking, it's the risk that I'm taking. I ain't never going to shut you out. Everywhere I'm looking now, I'm surrounded by your embrace. Baby, I can see your halo. And then she goes into the whole halo, halo, halo. Yeah. Um, And I love that there's wall because she almost climbed over the wall. Like there's just so many beautiful things where obviously this was the most perfect choice of a song. Yeah, 100%. And I, I, you know, Mary, you said you wanted it to be playing while they were dancing. And I kind of actually no 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 i i think i really disagree that's okay uh i just didn't like the dance music choice it was terrible no. uh, agreed watch it back friends you're gonna be like oh you're right uh i like that it's played when it is played as they're on the carriage ride and he tries to unveil I'm just used to bridgerton dance being like dance sex like eye sex ah. finger touch sex like yes. oh my gosh i want to smell the back of your ear and to this <laughs> okay. the pheromones you know what i mean like when they get in close and they like touch that part of your neck not like the physical back of your ear but you know like that tender area we all know that's like a simon thing i just <laughs> you just got all hot and bothered i did and i didn't all get that right i there. really like, did ooh, girl. but i didn't get that from their dancing and I wanted to have that. I wanted to have the, oh my goodness gracious, this is a Bridgerton dance scene, and I didn't get that. And that's okay. I just was expecting it. I didn't expect the big song to be in a carriage but, where you can't, 
I would have loved for them to even have a little like finger touching foreplay in the carriage while this okay, is playing. That's fair. Just saying, give me a little something to work a with. Something, something. But obviously we did it for a reason because nothing happened in the marital night. But I'm just saying I was ready to get hot and bothered and I didn't. Yeah. I, uh, the only sex in this episode was terrible with Lady Danbury. Oh, I was yeah. ready to have some swooning. Maybe this is part of the reason why it's only a four too for the <laughs> premiere episode. I'm like, where is it? A lack of good sex. Where's the licking the ice cream spoon? Come oh. on. Oh. Or still, still the sexiest scene of all, in all of television taking the glove off. That's what I'm talking about. Hey, my Hand own. Sex. That is some good stuff right there. <laughs> okay. Uh, anyway, I like that it's the song is played where it is. And I like it because it's this moment that Charlotte finally lets everything go. Mm-hmm. And she finally allows George to come in to her heart. It, we, and uh, this is part of, uh, I think this is, I think this is why the episode works so well for mm-hmm. me because we meet Charlotte and she is alone. People are making decisions for her. She shoves the bust over once she recognizes that she's basically been sold off to the to the to the to the crown to the British Empire. And she fights it at all cost and then she still fights it and even tries to <laughs> scale a wall yep. to get out of there. And Shonda Rhimes does something nice here. She allows Charlotte to be in her happy little life and be taken away from that. And if that's not enough, she goes to torture her even more with Michelle Fairley and the King's mother. And if that's not enough, she, uh, she has Brimsley and all the people following her around Mm -hmm. And if that's not enough, she even allows this interaction between George and Charlotte before they get married. And it's at that point we see a little bit of a shift. And at that that shift is important because Charlotte, as King George says, it's her choice. It's her choice to show up into the palace. It's her choice to walk up to he and uh, who's standing next to him, which is the Archbishop of Canterbury. And it's her choice to do what she wants. And that's important because she chooses to make the next step forward. The, the great writing device that Shonda Rhimes does is once she has that bit of change and she sees that she can operate in this world with the comfort of George and just George, she rips that all away again. And she sets her back and says, no, no, my life, the way that it was, should have been the way that I was making it. I've made a terrible choice. And now Charlotte and us as viewers have to go along on that journey, right? It, it, you talked about Pixar, Mary. Pixar is famous for that, right? Like think again, I, I always refer back to um, – Finding Nemo, which How to could me, you not? Finding Nemo is probably one of the most perfectly structured films of all time. Mm-hmm. And y- you look right at Marlin when he finally decides, okay, I can let Nemo go a little bit. I can let him do the whole thing. And then Nemo disappears and he gets hurt. And, and he says, why can't we just go back? I was there. My life was perfect. You're seeing the same exact thing happen here with Charlotte. And... At the end of the episode, she says, I should have climbed the wall because Mm -hmm. now her stasis has been disrupted. She wants to go back to her stasis. It's a fantastic, fantastic uh, structure for an episode. What would you say? I know you don't traditionally like premiere episodes, but do you think that this tells a good story unto itself? Yes. Yes. Well, it, it's an incomplete story. It's a, a one sixth of the story. I know, but do you think, as uh, you know, because traditionally, and I kind of like looking at this uh, a, a little bit more <sighs> critically, right? Like traditionally, a pilot or a first episode should tell a story unto itself. It should give you a beginning, middle, and end. Mm-hmm. Uh, and my, I'm positing that the beginning, middle, and end is. Charlotte, you know, not wanting to do the thing, her coming to a realization that she can and that the end is I was I, I was right. Choice. I made the wrong choice and she's stuck there alone. So I'm positing that that is the story unto itself. Would you agree with that or do you think that I don't that's know. enough? 
I don't think it's enough for me. And that's okay. why I gave it a four. <laughs> no, I thought you gave it a four because there was a lack of good sex. All of the above. <laughs> All of the above. Still love the episode. Remember, four is still a B. Yes. Okay. So, you ready? You yeah, ready sure. To shift a little bit. Yeah, of course. Um, opening credits. Very different than the Bridgerton style. It was this beautiful, yes. cool, really simple, simplified animation. Uh, sometimes there would be pr- uh, younger Queen Charlotte and then mirrored would be the elder Queen Charlotte taking us through different scenes that I assume we're going to be seeing in the uh, in the series itself. What did you think about this choice? Because it is very different. I loved, I didn't notice it the first time around. Okay. But the second time around, I did, and it was obviously the shadow of the older Queen Charlotte as the younger Queen Charlotte is walking through the halls and everything. I really liked that choice because it, it immediately tells you right off the jump that we're going to be talking about these parallel lines. Even if you're not paying attention, even if you're not seeing it, your brain does. Mm-hmm. And your your brain is is already starting to acknowledge the fact that we're getting two storylines here at the same time, which mm-hmm. is really cool. Yeah, I like the the music. It's a little bit more understated than Bridgerton. It's a little less. It's a little less whimsical, mm-hmm. if you will. It feels a little bit more grounded. Okay. Uh, and th- one of the music, uh, one piece of music that really stood out to me was when Queen Charlotte was woken up in the middle of the night, and as she elder wa- Queen Charlotte, yeah, okay. as she's walking towards the front door when she receives the news that the Princess Royal has passed away, yes. she doesn't know that yet. But as she's walking, it's like this, like almost like a death march, yes. like like a, like a imperial, You're getting nervous for like an her. imperial yes. march style, you know, like you know that kind mm. of feel, and yet at the same time we get this kind of frantic. Uh, pacing from when they're showing the carriage and the doctor mm. arriving. I, it just that that dichotomy of the two things happening. It, again, yeah. it shows you that they're using all of the resources that mm-hmm. they have to tell you a complete story. And and I think that the first half of the episode, it really blends the exposition and s- like show don't tell mm-hmm. very well. Uh, in terms of the relationship that uh, Princess Charlotte has with her brother uh, in relation to what's happening around Princess Charlotte uh, in terms of her being sold off, uh, essentially. Um, And then the relationship with Brimsley eventually and how he stands back. uh, And even the way that the Queen's, the King's mother interacts with all Mm. of, with all of her surroundings. I mean, that in general, that was so awkward having to look at her teeth and look at her hands. Um, it's, you know, in general, just made me feel awkward because here we are, this whole group of wealthy white people looking at this woman with brown skin. It almost yeah. evoked feelings of me of like what you'd be seeing uh, depicted in like slaving tr- slave trade ports. And sure. well, obviously, like women were seen as property back in this time frame. So in general, it just it made me feel lots of ickiness. And then, of course, the princess saying, you know, your job is to make, make as many babies as possible for my son and then you know the princess licks her thumb like a mother would do you know oh, trying to yeah. get something and tries to wipe off the freckle off of Charlotte's face oh. and it just broke me because of course it's when afterwards she starts these conversations about she's very brown but she's very brown this could be a problem I have had people lick their thumbs and try to wipe prominent freckles off of my face and it's been funny because as I've looked online people were thinking that she was just trying to wipe off you know maybe her makeup or her skin in general but I knew I'm like, she's going for that freckle because yeah. when you have like a prominent freckle, which obviously the actress who portrays the older version of Queen Charlotte has. And that's yeah. why now they've beautifully have been able to mimic the same look on the younger version. Correct. Um, come August, my freckles are really pronounced and I have like a really big one right at the tip of my nose. And it people looks like think chocolate. It's chocolate. Yeah, people yeah. think I had a fudgicle and I made a mess on my face. Um, and it's 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 embarrassing sometimes. But I'm over it. I mean, it's been on my nose forever. But when I saw that happen, I felt Charlotte. And for those of you who have a mole, a freckle, anything like that, that people always think is food or a mess. Yeah. You knew. You knew. You're like, oh, the mom thumb is coming. We know what this is going to be. Yeah. They always think it's chocolate. <laughs> um, but of course, you know, as I said, they, they were saying she was very brown. Uh, and they said, well, we told you that she had more blood. Um, and so for people who don't know, this is more M-O-O-R. Yes. Right. Yes. And um. It's not because I, I don't I don't know if everyone understands what more 
well referred we're, to. We're going to. I just, always think of Othello. Moors is a term generally used by Europeans to describe the Muslim people of North Africa and the Iberian Peninsula during the Middle Ages. And they traditionally had darker skin. Correct. So uh, for people who didn't, who weren't aware of that, that's. Um, that's, of course, what that refers to. And then from this, they decide that they're going to expand the guest list for the wedding and make sure that more of, quote, her people are, are there filling out the ton, um, filling out the guest list. So this was a really interesting thing. I loved the choice that they made to explain how the Bridgerton verse became so diverse, because mm -hmm. obviously in all of the period dramas that we've seen pretty much our entire lives, it's always been white people. And so that was one of the big things that shook things up when Bridgerton came out. And it was such a diverse cast. And I love that they were explaining that it wasn't always like this, mm -hmm. that there was a decision made and here's how it became to be. Um, so I just, I love that. I'm excited to see how this fleshes out in this season a mm -hmm. bit more because I think it is really cool that it decided to make an origin story for the diversity. Mm -hmm. That's, I agree with you, Mary, and, that, and that's where the episode could have gotten bogged down and that's why I wanted to call out the that whole exposition part where... You know, there there has to be an explanation here for all of this. And there has to be an explanation of like, okay, do we do this? And do we not do this? And how does this work? Mm -hmm. And it's not like, well, as you know, we don't mm -hmm. allow uh black people into the in into uh the you know the royal the families. Time. Like yes. it's you know, it, it's the whole thing. What the show does is that the queen breaks it all down, but in a kind of condescending manner. Mm -hmm. And it's believable that she would break it down for all of her advisors the way that she did. It mm -hmm. works. Yes. And it also works how we understand Lady Danbury mm -hmm. and Lord Danbury finally get their titles when she, the queen, or the queen, decides king's mother to make just it decides, up so that it fits. Hey. Love it. Lord Danbury. And he's like, wait, what? Yes. You know, like, that works. That that makes sense. There's no further explanation needed. Now, what's cool is that, of course, this entire show is through the premise of like that this is loosely based upon fact, but most of it, of course, is fiction. Now, there is some evidence that may show that actually the original Queen, Queen Charlotte um, did have some... African blood may have been darker skin, uh, could have been mixed races. So whether it's been just through things that have been said or portraits that people have been able to see of her, where different characteristics. So I love that there is this question, you know, was Queen Charlotte, who was married to George the Third, that all is true, that she could have been mm -hmm. um maybe the first, you know, black queen or, you know, a mixed race, like however it might have been. And this I need to bring in. I think is so poignant in this day and age with all of the drama that has been going on with Meghan Markle in the current monarchy. Oh, yeah. And I asked Blake this question yesterday before we decided to, that we were going to be recording today. And I said, I, need, I, I don't know if I should bring this up because obviously people are in two different camps. They either like are on the Meghan Markle side or the the royal, the royal family, family side. side. Yep. And uh, other, there's other people who are like, I'm just so sick of this. But I think it's very poignant to bring out because Netflix is is obviously on the Harry and Meghan Markle side. Yeah, well, they they're, did they're that invested. giant, yes, <laughs> invested. invested. <laughs> yes, they did that giant documentary with them. Um, also, Netflix chose to publish and and put out the Queen Charlotte series on May fourth, two days before King Charles' coronation. Yeah. So I found it very interesting that here they are celebrating, granted, mostly based in fiction, but a a member of the royal family who is black and having uh, people in the royal family kind of put that person down. How is society going to adjust the, to this? How are people going to handle this dark skin mm -hmm. <laughs> days before <laughs> uh, all of this happened? And as I said, Netflix already has shown that they are, like you said, invested in some way, shape or form with the Harry, Meghan, Markle uh, feelings and storyline. So I just thought it was a very interesting choice seeing has what they've done before mm -hmm. um, and the timing of it. Yeah, I mean, there's... <laughs> I, Mary, and for those of you who are listening to this and be like, Mary, you're crazy, or, you know, Mary, like, you have no evidence. Like, no, there is no evidence. Like, you're just, I think you're just extrapolating out the, the, timing of it all right I, I think that's what i'm saying though. Yeah. i think the timing is very interesting that it came out two days before charles's coronation 
And also just saying that the timing of how they've had this Netflix documentary yeah. really focused on um, someone who was in the royal family who was a person of color and the issues that that she faced with with racism that she she yeah, had against it, her. So I'm just saying, I think that it's a very interesting thing. I'm not saying that this was the reason for this series whatsoever, but I'm just saying all these things are interesting. It's worthy to, it's, it's worthy to bring up because what there's some smoke there. Right. And I'm not saying that there's a bunch of fire, but if you extrapolate out the details mm-hmm. and you look at it for, on the whole and considering how much Netflix has invested in Harry and Megan, yeah, I I think there's enough to talk about where it's like, mm, just keep is that it the, the reason? Front or no, but no. but interesting might, to keep it, the conversation going. It might be colored by that, like it might be like. And then if you are on the flip side too, like like we did watch the coronation and everything, it was really fun to be able to watch a lot of these things that are British monarchy and uh, and then see the coronation, you know, to see that really thin hall yes. in the in the church where the king and queen get married. And then of course you get to see all these very thin halls two days later when you watch right, right. King Charles uh, have his coronation. My, my so. first thought was, you know, during the, <laughs> during the, uh, the coronation, they're like, Oh yeah, he's in that carriage. It's so uncomfortable. Blah, 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 blah. blah. And they were just talking about how that carriage was just so uncomfortable. For, for the, the 30 minute ride. And, and like, here she is for six hours with whalebone. You know, and, in the same freaking carriage essentially. And I'm like, well, okay, first of all, let's calm down. Mm-hmm. Okay. That carriage, are just made out of friggin' pure gold. All right, relax. Yeah. All right. Secondly, it ain't that long of a drive. Thirdly, he's the king of freaking England. All right. I'm sure <laughs> you know they that there's some plenty of, of comfort in that carriage. <laughs> and when I saw the carriage uh, for the first time, when when uh, the British royalty go up to up to Germany for to go cor- get, oh, you know, okay, in the show, I was like, wow, that must have been such an uncomfortable know, ride, right? huh? <laughs> Such an uncomfortable ride. Another thing that I think is interesting to point out, because once again, this show is loosely based upon facts, but the facts would have been that there was a King George III who did marry Charlotte. Yes. And uh, this is King George. Okay, so as we meet him, granted this is a fictionalized show, but this is the King George for all of our Outlander fans, who is the king right now as we're heading into the revolution. Correct. This is the king who is there for the revolution. So all of our Hamilton friends, remember, you'll be back soon. You'll see that yes. is this King George. Yes, it okay? is. So as you watch him, you can like sing that in your head. Like, da, 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 da. <laughs> okay, that is this supposed same King George. So I think that it's a very interesting thing because a lot of the fandoms, you know, we're, as I said, we're going into Outlander season. It was, is one of the shows that we also cover. I think that it's interesting to think as we watch Outlander. As you listen to Hamilton, as you just revisit revolutionary times, that this would have been that same king. Yeah, it's it's kind of sad knowing what happens to King George. Mm -hmm. And I mean, just within just within the Bridgerton verse. Right. Like we we already understand what happens to King George. And it's a sad thing. And the show, I think, plays on that very well. The Queen Charlotte. Definitely. The, the the show itself definitely cashes in on some of the equity that we have for these characters, right? Already. Like, mm-hmm. that's already built in. And it's highlighted by the fact that they're including the current, you know, characters, mm-hmm. like the current Bridgerton timeline characters into the story as well. And I think... That is the right choice, because in order for you to buy the relationship between George and Charlotte, you, in my estimation, you have to be connected to the. Uh, let's just call you it. You need to love of, someone. Well, already. you you have to love somebody, and you have to love their relationship as it exists mm-hmm. in the current timeline, mm-hmm. right? Because if you don't appreciate the tragedy. Of it all, right? It, like when King George walks in and he's like talking to Queen Charlotte in in season two, like you know she was younger and everything. And like if you don't buy into Queen Charlotte yes. walking next to the paintings yes. and her looking at them longingly, then you're not going to buy this show no. at all. No. So it's it's very dependent upon you, upon 
You having that Shonda knowledge. Rhimes cashing in on what she's already built. Agreed. Having said all that, I think it's also pertinent and worthy of talking about when Queen Charlotte demands of her children that they make her royal oh, babies. Sorrows, sorrows, prayers. They're very funny, by the way. <laughs> sorrows, sorrows, prayers. Virgins to the yet left, at the same to time, the right. Yet at the same time, we look at Michelle Fairley as the queen, as the king's mother, speaking to Charlotte in that tone of, yeah. you have great hips. You're going to make many, many babies yes. for, my, for my son. Huh. Is the show making a comment there? Is the show saying something about Queen Charlotte there where it's very, it's very uh, intentional, in my opinion, that Princess Charlotte shows up and she's demanded that she makes babies. She queen Charlotte it. is there as an older queen later on and she says, make babies, make lots of babies. I need them now. Is the show making a comparison there between the two characters? Sure, yes. And I, to be honest, like Charlotte doesn't fight the fact, oh, my job is to make babies. I feel like the mother needs to say that. Yes. But we know that. Charlotte knows what her job is. Women at that age and knew, knew what they were supposed to do, particularly if you are marrying the king, that is your job to make the heirs. Mm -hmm. and, and she did that. Um, I will say what I didn't like, of course, Sarah Sarah's prayers was, was funny. But this is now her son. Who is crying, or or maybe even her grandson? I, I didn't understand who no, the that's person her crying. Son. And then the person that was who died his daughter. Was, was that's his yes. daughter? Yeah. So, um, I just it was hard for me because once again I felt a little detached. You know, I said I don't love anybody in this show yet. So the queen we've been able to see over the past two seasons of of Bridgerton is a little detached. She's the queen. She's just completely like in her own space and in her own world. We had those tender moments when we did get to understand the push and pull that she has with her relationship with the king. Mm -hmm. But that was it. And here we are. And I don't really see her as a warm and loving mother. And I am so grateful that we were able to have that with the Bridgerton family. Yes. Because this is, you know, to me, her parenting was hands off. It was probably done by nannies. It was done by governesses. Like mm -hmm. her job was to rule and be with the king and have all these babies. Um, I, but uh, the flip side... I'm saying I don't think she had a problem with having to have babies. I think she knew her job and she understands the job and the pressure. And once that pressure is off of her husband, maybe that will make him feel better. Maybe that will, will be less of a burden on him and a burden on her. And then she can really just focus on her time with him mm -hmm. versus having to be like, oh, my gosh, this is crazy. But I just didn't I didn't love that she felt like such a cold mother. Mm. And where the heck have all these 13 kids been during these two <laughs> previous seasons of Bridgerton? Because that's the other thing. I'm trying to figure out the, the timeline. But obviously, Lady Whistledown is writing these papers. So right. it's still within the same time frame. And yet, none of her daughters or sons, to our knowledge, have been at these balls that we've gone to all this time. She hasn't been introducing them, trying to parade them around, choosing one of her own daughters as a diamond of a season or matching a diamond sure. of the season up with her own kids. So that, to me, just didn't fit. It was like when a puzzle piece should fit, but it doesn't. And yeah. you're like, oh, Okay, well, where they've been all this time? Well, but I mean, I mean logically, they came up with this idea I, of the show later, yeah, right. so whatever. Logically, none of the kids were cast, obviously, and so they, yes. they never even really had the opportunity to create the story. So they have to kind of. Do you know why you know, Queen Charlotte was created? Uh, to make more money. So there is this lady <laughs> named Jacqueline Avant okay. who is the who was sadly the mother-in-law of the Netflix CEO. Okay, so Netflix CEO married this woman. And her mom loved the character of Queen Charlotte. Mm -hmm. Like, love, love, loved her in the show. Mm -hmm. Oh, my God, she's my favorite. She's my favorite. So Netflix CEO says to Shonda, hey, my mother-in-law loves Charlotte. Would you ever think about making a show about her? Sure. And that gets the wheels spinning. Sadly, this woman, Jacqueline Avant, the mother-in-law of the Netflix CEO, was killed in her house hey. by a gunman. Oh, my goodness. Like, tragically in 2021. And that started this all, where it was like, we need to do this for this woman. Wow. And she was like a, an amazing philanthropist. So not only was she the mother-in-law, but she was like an amazing philanthropist. And her husband was really big into the arts. And um, it was... It was a big loss. Sure. So, yeah. and a tragic loss, obviously. So, that's how this all even got started. So, if wow. you watch at the end of this episode, it says that it's de dedicated to her. Wow. Interesting. Interesting. I did not know that. But then also, yes, it can make more money. But well, that, yeah. was, that was the, 
you know, what started everything going, Wow, which I thought was pretty interesting. Well, I mean, it's also very successful because considering the fact that it's been number one on Netflix now since its uh, premiere yes. date, obviously we're, we're recording this after the premiere date. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, it's but, been number one for a while. But that's now. why, in, a, in, in general, like we didn't get to see these kids all this time and they haven't necessarily been talked about in the Whistledown sure. papers. Um, but however, Lady Whistledown throws it down, you know, saying the now, you know, basically calling out the crisis like does the queen even have knowledge of how to make a good marriage or is it just all talk um yeah and i'm thinking about this within context mary and i'm glad you brought it up because why well now that we know some history for queen charlotte why does she make it her job to make sure that she picks the the diamond of the season right like what about her idea. matchmaking abilities. Like, why does she take this under herself? I have an idea. Okay, go ahead. Okay. First off, George calls her incomparable in this episode. Yes. And how lovely that that is what she then does when she picks a young woman to be the diamond of the season, calling yeah. them un- incomparable. Or un- uncomparable. Uncomparable. Or incomparable. Sorry. Incomparable. In- yeah. You know what I'm saying. Yes, I got potato, 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 potatoes. <laughs> so I love that she's able to bring that delight and awe yep. to younger generations of young women, like how it was able to do for her, gave mm-hmm. her little butterflies and made her feel special. I'm wondering if this is because she loves love and knows the potential of it so much that she wants to see it blossom and happen, that she doesn't always get to be with her husband and with her love. Like had we not had that moment where the King came out in season two at the end, Mm. you know, thinking that the wedding and stuff was their wedding Mm -hmm. and you saw her heart sink and we understand the love that she has for him. Had we not had that, I, it would, this would be very difficult for me. Yeah. Like we know that there's going to be a great love story and a very complicated love story here. Um, and part of me thinks that she wants to set everybody up because she has hope that there will be more love like that in the future, that she was capable of having this kind of love. And she wants that for others. She just can't put it into words. Sure. I like that. I like that explanation. I'm just giving a positive, <laughs> a positive spin on it. Yeah. I get you. You know, it's sneaky thing here that if you're not paying attention, you won't see it. But at the beginning of the episode, when she is walking down the stairs and she goes, answers the door, and the doctor shows up and she says, is he dead? Mm-hmm. Implicit in this whole scene is that they still live apart. Yes. They still live apart. Mm-hmm. And she still lives in the same place. Mm-hmm. I, I find that uh, pretty remarkable because obviously they're telling a story here, right? Mm-hmm. And, and that story is going to involve a love story. And... She does, as you eventually recognize, you have 13 children with this man. And 15, she does, but two pass. Sure. Uh, and she does love him very mm-hmm. much. Again, because of the equity that we've we've cashed in on from the mm-hmm. previous, from Bridgerton season two and, and, and somewhat season one. They still live apart. And. Uh, and how sad that is. Yeah. My and it just makes you, you realize like all in the previous seasons when is he dead is he you know she's always asking yes. always asking that is the king dead is the well, king dead why is she asking that do you think because I think now looking you through it through this lens of a lover I think that is her greatest fear and it's always weighing on her mm. and now too it's like if we don't have an heir yet what the heck right oh my gosh right. he needs to just keep on going because if he's still going that means that she can still help run the run everything but otherwise if he passes then it's going to go to like his firstborn kid who isn't ready yet and they don't have a legitimate heir given the scene with the wall and everything Mm -hmm. and given the the marriage are are you buying the potential of this relationship he was so mean at the end at the end I was so in. I'm like, all right, Bridgerton let's gave me my swoon moment I love it and then he was so mean I do believe that there's potential because this is Bridgerton. So you, are you buying or selling right now? I'm buying. You're buying? Okay. I'm buying. All right, fair. I, I, I mean, that's that's totally fair. You know, I'm not buying. What's that? Lady Danbury and her husband. Oh, oh my gosh. Talk that, about When gross. he takes the teeth out? The only oh. sex scene we get in this episode is that, guys. <laughs> and then, yeah, the teeth and if, wife, you can nap if you'd like. Oh, oh man. So she goes in, she takes a hot bath. I had no warning. This is disgusting. Yeah. Oh, my goodness gracious. Yeah. However, uh, Danbury also, as she's leaving, she warns 
Charlotte, you know, be careful and send, if you send for me, I will come. So I'm really excited. You know, like you said, we get to build, build upon the relationship that we know that they have in their older years. So this is exciting to see that begin. And then also when you start looking at, I mean, of course, I think it's important that Lady Bridgerton is there in Mm -hmm. the current timeline. So I want to see how these relate, that relationship develops too. Little Violet? Yeah, with Violet. Okay. And how, like when she comes along, are they going to explore that, right? Like it's it's by no coincidence that Violet gets the letter. Gets the well, yes, and that and that About. everybody everybody is there and yes. like because that was the funeral letter, in my opinion, because everyone correct. was wearing black. Correct. So I just think it's I think it's important that we recognize that too, and how these how these three women develop their relationship mm-hmm. and what comes of that, right? And how and the role that they all play in the great experiment, right? Yes. So again, this is why the show is taking on. A lot. It is. It's taking on so much that just like Pro Brimsley, he's got a lot on his plate. Oh man, it was so sad when she asks Brimsley at the end when she's like, "Are you going to be with me forever?" Like she asks him a second time. Yes. And then it fades into Brimsley and she like alone in this home. Like, oh man, that was so freaking. I loved the scene of them on the stairs and him always being five steps behind her. She was checking it out. So fun. Perfect in in every way because Mm -hmm. again, it shows you instantly the kind of relationship that they're they're going to have, that they're supposed to have, Mm -hmm. and what that transition will eventually be like for him to for him to only say facts about the king and then turn around and go back another few steps. Uh, and, 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 you know, and visually he's below her, Correct. like quite liter- literally, literally. She's below asking, her. can you please just stand next to me? I have to ask you questions. I want to talk to you like a normal person yes. side by side. And it's just not allowed. But I mean, think about that. She, she marries King George, but really she's also essentially marrying Brimsley. And that's what she yes. asks him. Are we together for life? Yes. Is that really how this is going to be? Do you buy how, I love him, by the way. I'm so excited to explore more time with him. Do you, do you buy When he how? lost the queen and he's freaking oh, out. Oh, it was ah. great. <laughs> he's like- You had one sorry, job. Trying to calmly walk around yes. and then it just slowly builds to him just running. Yep. Um, do you buy how all the staff handle the mystery? And do you buy how the show is handling the mystery of oh, King George? It's killing me. It is killing me the tension. What is wrong with him? Now, had we not known, had we not seen older version of the king- Come on out and be cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs, essentially, yes. in that episode. Um, and even still, like even still, if you go into research, they're still not 100% fully diagnosing what it is sure. that uh, George suffered from. The mm-hmm. closest that a lot of people are thinking is that maybe he had bipolar disorder. Mm-hmm. Um, but if you forget that, if you forget the flash, the, the forward knowledge that we have of King George, if you if you hadn't done any research on that King George yeah, there'd be so much mystery to you right now. You'd be like, why is this guy so lovely and wonderful in the garden and now an absolute jerk? And then you see him have toil with himself when Charlotte says, I thought you were just George. And you see him for a moment want to be just George again. But then he has to to make that decision. No. So I love it. I think they did a really beautiful job. Yeah, I kind of buy it. I I like the mystery of it all. I think it works within itself Mm -hmm. uh, as a show, number one. And I also think it works within the framework of the Bridgerton verse writ large, right? Because Mm -hmm. you do know that something is wrong. You do know. And what you don't know is what is wrong and how he gets from A to Z, right? How does he go? How does he go from I'm just George to, hey, this is our wedding day and I'm in my pajamas? Oh, okay. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> right. Yes. Uh, and the fireworks and the whole mm-hmm. thing. Like, how does how does that happen at the beginning, all the way to the end, and then him being shuffled off? Mm-hmm. That works, I think, within within the larger within the larger story as well. Yeah. And I'm interested to see how this affliction, in whatever capacity it takes, is not only brought up in the show but worked around and Mm -hmm. when does charlotte uh come to the recognition that something is and how do they start to make babies they got 15 babies they got to be in the same bed at some point yeah you know what i also want to know too is how far along the line does the show go right how far along the story does the show take place 
with the younger version of these characters, mm-hmm. right? What What's the timeline? Like, are they only going over a year of their lives? Are they going over the first 15 years of their lives? Are we going to see pregnant Charlotte as in the younger version of herself? Like, there's a lot happening here. Uh, again, it, it's just a lot. Like, they, they, they have taken on some big responsibilities for this character and 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 writing uh, responsibilities. I will say that the show itself, the directing of it feels bigger. Do you know what I mean? Yes. It feels bigger. I mean, it should be. This is the king and queen we're talking about. Well, yeah. But, and, and I think the, the visual language of the show fits that. Mm-hmm. Whereas Bridgerton felt... A little bit more condensed, a little cozy, and it also, but it also felt a little bit more whimsical and a little bit more um, artful, if you know what mm, I mean. Brid- okay. Like the Bridgerton series does, especially season one, right? Because there, there is this difference between season one and season two. Yes, I, right. Like there is clear a clear, even darker tone to season two, like visually than season one. But this feels a little bit more. Queen Charlotte feels a little bit more, I don't want to say Downton Abbey-esque, mm. but it feels formal, more formal, more regal, just bigger in general. Like the, the, the huge sweeping shots of the, of the palaces and in and, and Germany and, and the, the, the drone shots, if you will, of the carriages going through the pathways, going, getting into England and like, it's just bigger, you know. Even the grounds uh, of of the palaces are are mm-hmm. much like we even have that first shot in Germany of of the big fountain going through. It almost looks like fireworks at first, yeah. and then you realize no, it's just a water fountain. Um, I think that was very purposeful, by the way. The the fireworks, it, having it look like fireworks, mm-hmm. but it's not right. It's just water. I think that's very purposeful, calling back to season two of Bridgerton yeah. and letting you know that, that something's going to explode here. This is going to, this is going to be a much larger story than what you think. So visually, I think that it works that way. Love it. Yeah. You got anything else for this episode, my love? No, I mean, I think we, we covered so many of the bits and pieces and I'm, I'm excited to continue to delve in more into Queen Charlotte and, yeah. and everybody we got to meet. Is Queen Charlotte the younger version, how much different is she than the older version that we see? I believe it's the same person. Really? Yep. Why do you, like, given, I mean, there are differences between the two, right? Not not just physical or age, but just characteristic differences. Well, I know that they were told that they didn't have to mimic everything. So we think about Harry Potter when the actors drink polyjuice potion and they actually had the the original actors act a scene out and then yeah. the people who were the actors acting as the other people, they would then kind of follow suit and try to mimic every single little bit. And I believe that Shonda had told the new cast, the younger cast, you do not need to do that. You do not need to learn every single quirk and tick and say things the exact same way that they do. But I believe that they did work on casting people who still have the air of confidence that Charlotte and Lady Danbury would have had. Um, and and Brimsby, like I love that he they g- gave him like a glow up. Um, mm-hmm. You know, I I don't know. I I believe it. I'm here for it. Yeah. I think that they found really people who who display the confidence beautifully. Yeah. It is hard for me because this version of Charlotte, you know, I'd hope that she would a bit more caring of a mother at yeah. some point, but on the flip side, that is the original Charlotte, the older version that we've known all this time and she hasn't been a caring mother. Yeah. So, it's okay. And and one of the things that I think comes through too is the level of relationships that the queen now has, like zero. Right. <laughs> She's got Lady Danbury. Right. Even her ish. even her brother, the mm-hmm. one who told her to shut up. Stop talking. Yes. Now has a very formal farewell. Very formal. Wishing farewell. her many babies. Yes. And you know, your majesty, the whole thing. Mm-hmm. And she's like, hey, whoa, Adolphus, like what what are you what are you yeah. doing? And, and <laughs> very purpose very yes. purposeful. And when she is it's all capped off by her sitting in that bed. Oh my gosh. Sitting in that bed saying, I should have jumped the wall. Yep. And again, I have to go back to Shonda Rhimes mm-hmm. and the quality of the writing here where she uses that transition. She uses that, you know, that halo effect mm-hmm. against the queen. Yeah. And she uses that 
to put her in a place where she has to grow Ugh. and set her up to be the person that she eventually becomes. So sad. And also a starting point for this relationship, mm-hmm. right? Because yes, we buy in, uh, we're buying into the relationship, great. But it has to have, it has to go from somewhere to another place. It has to grow. And we are now in a spot at the end of this episode where it can either get really, really bad. No, it has to get good. There has to be so really much good. sex. They have to have 15 <laughs> babies. All the sex. I need a little nipple, a little butt. I don't know. I will say, okay, because I, I'll be real with you. I was a little disappointed in the sex in season two. And I know that this isn't what the show is about. It's not just all about that. And we, we yes. went through that lots. I get it. Okay. But in episode one, Bridgerton, obviously Daphne and Simon weren't having sex. They weren't oh. bell up against the swan bookcase, sex. swan sex, all of it. But we had, we still had uh, Anthony. We had Anthony with his butt all over the place yes. with the singer. Yes. And I was like, it, no, it was at the, at the bridge, the tree. They at were the at tree. the tree. Oh, I was all like, the tree splinters. sex. Splinters. All the splinters. So many splinters. <laughs> so even, and, and the sex we got in this one was yucky. It was gross. Old old sex. Old, old man sex. sex. No one wants Denture old sex. sex. Denture so, sex. <laughs> so I hope that we the only sex that we don't have for a while is going to be denture sex. I assume that there's going to be more denture sex. Uh, there will be more denture sex. Okay. I don't think, however, that's going to be the only sex that we get. I, if anything- They need to have 15 babies. Yeah, it's. Co- it, it's I was just going to say it's coming. <laughs> Unless the only other thing I was thinking about is, does she sleep with somebody else to have the 15 babies? Oh, does Queen Charlotte have an affair? Interesting. And that would uh, that would be poetic because all of the children that she has, mm-hmm. they all have illegitimate children. And yeah. if she has sex with somebody else, that would make them yeah. technically illegitimate children. Yeah. I kind of like that idea. Thank you. I like, I'm going to, I am co-signing on that idea. Ooh. Great. Predi- I was going to say, Mary, let's do some predictions. I mean. But you just took it to the house there. Somebody needs to have sex. And it can't be just the Dan Perry's. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Marvin, you ready to close this bad boy out? Mm-hmm. All right, let's do it, shall we? We shall. Well, ladies and gents, if this was your first time hanging out with Blake and I, we want to thank you so incredibly much. Uh, it really means so much that you take the time to hang out with us because we are. We've been hanging out with you in your ear pods, in your car, while you've been working out, while you've been doing something or other. And we are grateful, uh, especially for our dearest, newest listeners. Yes, uh, we are so happy to welcome you to Mary and Blake Media. Of course, we do want you to go to maryandblake.com to check out all the other great podcasts that we have. Right now, currently, we are working on Outlander. And, and you are, can check out all the Bridgerton episodes. Yes, all the foremost. Bridgerton episodes. Yeah, absolutely. If you are new to Bridgerton with Mary and Blake, please go to uh, Bridgerton with Mary and Blake <laughs> uh, and check that out. You can even just go on social and just look up the hashtag Bridgerton with Mary and Blake. Now, for all of you, we would love for you to drop a screenshot take a screenshot of your phone of your device and throw it up in your stories you can tag us on instagram mary and blake media uh you can shout us out on facebook but the coolest thing with podcasts is that people really learn about them when other people tell them about it and this is the number one show on netflix so if you enjoyed this episode of the podcast i promise you there is someone on your social media feed who has also watched the queen charlotte (laughs) netflix show and they may want to explore this maybe it'll be their first time ever listening to a podcast But if you could share this and let people know that you enjoyed it, it would mean the absolute world to Blake and I. Yes. And if you found that we have provided value for you in your Queen Charlotte experience or Bridgerton experience, do consider going to Apple Podcasts and writing a or leaving a written review and rating. Uh, If it's good, thank you. If If it's it's bad, bad, leave one. If it's bad, (laughs) we'll take it. It's okay. But the written reviews. I'll just cry alone in my bed saying I should have gone over the wall. (laughs) (laughs) The written reviews do help in a sense that. Other people uh, are easier to find it. Yeah. Well, uh, they understand that the show is still current. They understand that we're talking about Queen Charlotte and it gives them a flavor of what to expect. So yes, yes, it does help it make it a little bit more discoverable. All right. On that note, my friends, ladies and gents, my name is Mary. My name is is just Blake. (laughs) No, go brew some more tea.